heteronuclear single quantum correlation. For all intents and purposes, they give you the same information. The HSQC technique requires phasing. Remember what you did on your, you phased on your nosy spectra, right? On the 2D, or on the, what did you do? You phased on the nosy, the 2D phasing? Am I getting? By the mouse, and you, you get the box, and you do one side and the other. The HSQC technique requires that. The HMQC technique doesn't require that. Phil's done a great job in the spec lab of making most of the experiments really easy to run so you don't have to be super expert technically to implement these. The ones where you have phasing require a little more skill to implement. As it turns out, we tried to implement both the HMQC and the HSQC, and the HSQC toxi ends up being a little better for this. And in fact, right now, Ryan's working, working up an example of this for the final exam. So, uh, so I do think what we're talking about is important. All right, we've gotten to a point. I mean, toxi, when I first introduced just plain old TOXI as part of our sort of suite of four correlation experiments. Remember I said we're going to take our core of correlation experiments as COSY, TOXI, HMQC, HMBC. And then I said I don't want us to get overwhelmed in information and acronyms. So I said let's start with COSY and HMQC and use those as our basics for addressing 2D spectra. And then we brought in HMBC, and we saw how HMBC can be really useful for putting the pieces together. And I talked about TOXI, and then we had, for example, the Vale Alla pro pro problem where we saw how TOXI could be really powerful for elucidating spin systems, because TOXI can be like a super cozy. Either you can get the whole spin system at once, or Remember that spin lock mixing time parameter. If you start and begin with a really small spin lock mixing time, you can go like one more jump beyond cozy. And if you go and have a longer parameter, you can go, go two jumps and three jumps. So you can use a series of toxic spectra like a super cozy spectrum. And as long as you have some regions that don't overlap, you're in good shape. So let me just diagram what I mean. In other words, in COSY, right, we're going from one proton to the next and then to the next. So this is COSY. In TOXY, we get those same correlations as COSY, but now you go beyond, you hop through the spin system. And so what HMQC toxi and HSQC toxi do is they're basically like toxi, but with the advantage of the dispersion of the C13 dimension. I'll say like toxi, but with dispersion of C13 dimension. And in terms of what they're good for, I'll say good for overlap. And basically, so the, the other thing I'll say is that these can be used like cozy, by varying the mixing time. And I think the best way to illustrate all this information, which sounds really abstract, is to take a problem, a spectral structure problem, a puzzle problem that occurred, a real problem that occurred, and show how powerful these techniques are. 
So the problem that came up and was, was exemplified in your Croaceman book is the following. An NMR tube of a natural product was left in the refrigerator for 18 months. So slowest reaction that, that you will ever do is basically you leave your chemical in an NMR tube in your refrigerator, and then you come back and you take a spectrum and you find out that your stuff is no longer what it used to be. This has happened to me too. And you're curious, what's going on? What has happened to my chemical? So the chemical here is a marine natural product called bromomalleol. And the reaction is basically 18 months. in CDCl3 at 4 degrees Celsius. And what is happening, chloroform breaks down. Chloroform photooxidizes. You get acid in it. That's why when I have an important sample, I generally like to pass my chloroform through a plug of alumina that I've dried in a furnace or a flame to take the acid out and take the water out. I don't pass my sample through it. I just take a little glass pipette put a little plug of glass wool in there, put about a centimeter of flame or furnace dried alumina in, you know, alumina that I've dried myself in the, in the pipette, pass my chloroform through before making my sample. But on standing and with light and oxygen, chloroform oxidizes and you get catalytic amounts of acid. So I'll put in parenthesis catalytic H plus and I'll put the H plus in, in quotes because, of course, in chloroform, when you photooxidize it, it's D plus. But you're not getting deuterium in your molecule because it's a catalytic amount. So basically, we're getting some reaction in the style of the Chem 203 class, like you've learned in Professor Van Vranken's class, that has made this molecule do something. And what it's formed is an isomer with five CH2 groups and no alcohol. And so the puzzle that we have is to figure out what's happening to our bromomalleol. Five CH2 groups and no OH groups, no alcohol. But it still has an oxygen in it, and so we've got to figure out what's, what's happened to our molecule. All right, so we'll start with the HMQC spectrum here. Of course, you have your proton and your carbon spectrum. And one thing that's, that's pretty clear is the proton spectrum really is, is a mess here. We've got one peak down here at four parts per million that's pretty well resolved. We've got a couple of peaks over here that look kind of normal, maybe something diastereotopic. We've got this big heap here around 2 ppm. We've got something here at about 1.5 ppm that looks like it's a single proton. Not as clear what's happening here. We've got some singlets here. There are four singlets, one, two, three, four, that have to be methyl groups. They're integrating to three hydrogens. We have a peak here and a peak here. There's a lot of overlap in this spectrum. In fact, in this spectrum, I probably wouldn't even know where to begin on lettering it. I'd probably, you know, if I slapped an integral on it, you'd basically see a big rise over here. So one way to deal with this is just to go ahead and use the HMQC and to put your numbers on directly from the HMQC. So I've already taken and labeled your axes with your your hydrogen count, your, uh, your methines and, and methyls and methylenes from, say, a depth spectrum. And we've gotten our, our carbons here. And so we have, 
have some numbers here. And let's see. So if we're correlating our carbons and our protons, I'm just going to transcribe our, our numbers here. So we have our methine, which is number four here. This guy here looks like it's number 10 and 10. By the time we get over to this next multiplet here, it's less clear. We're getting an, a cross peak from 8 and a cross peak from 5. You continue along into, into this region over here, and it looks like we've got 8 kind of also on top of this one. But he's heaped right on top of, of another one here. So let's see, what do we have over here? We have the one that's been, been labeled as 7. So we've got 8 and 7 kind of lumped on top of each other. We've got, looks like we've got 14 kind of up here. 14 and maybe maybe in the middle of here we've kind of got got 12 this guy mercifully stands out as the methine for 3 Then it's a little, little hard to see, but we have our methyl singlets here. So you have a methyl, a methyl, a methyl, and a methyl as you move across. So you have 9 over here, 11, and then the next methyl is, I think, um, 13, and then 15 if I'm looking at the alignment. And then the last, last one that's coming here is the other diastereotopic one from 7. So that's kind of, kind of our Rosetta Stone for trying to address this in the way that we've addressed it before. I haven't even tried to label these by letters, but if you wanted, you, of course, could go A, B, C. You know, it'd become like D, D prime. You know, God knows what here. So maybe this is a better strategy here. All right, let's take a look at how far this strategy is going to get us in the cozy. And so what I'm going to do is flip, flip to the next, to the next page here. And here's our cozy spectrum. And normally at this point, we'd want to try to build up some of the structure. So let, let me get a clear blackboard and see how, see how far we can go. So again, I will start to transcribe my numbers here. So 4, 10, 10, 8 and 5 kind of heaped on top of each other. 14, 12, 14, 8 and 7 kind of heaped on top of each other. 3, 9, 11. Did I remember to do, oops, it looks like on the previous one, one more little guy I missed here, so let me bounce back for a second. Looks like I missed that little guy over here, which 12. Okay, yeah, right off of 12 here. So we've got 12, so we've got another diastereotopic methylene. So let's see, let me go and transcribe all of those numbers over here. So we have 9, 11, 12. Uh, 15 and 13 here, and then 7. 
So cozy, this is a phase sensitive cozy and I'll probably talk about this technique on Friday's lecture. So you're used to cozy cross peaks that are sort of square. This is a phase sensitive technique and you can extract your coupling constants out of the spacing of these spots here, uh, which is good when you've got heavily overlapping, heavily overlapping spectra. But what we can't really do is walk our way very far through this. So for example, if we look at this cross peak, right, this is 4 cross 10. So this is 4 to 10 over here for both of these. So OK, that's, that's at least a start. So 4 is a methine. We have C4H and C10H2. All right, let's see, let's see how far we can go with this. So now if we go off of 10, 10 crosses into this mess here. So we've got 10 cross either 8 or 5 over here, right? So we've got 10 to 8, 8 or 5, and then here, 10 to 8 or 7 over there. So we're probably getting 10 to 8, but it's really, really kind of hard to be sure at this point, right? Here, so if we say, all right, well, we're kind of stuck over here. Let's come off of 3 and see if we can do any better. So we'll say, all right, let's try this cross peak here. This is 3 cross, well, that's going to be cross 5 or 8. So that's kind of confusing. Then in this whole region here, we've just got severe overlap. And so now we basically, basically have done as much as we can with the cozy spectrum of this. It's kind of unsatisfying. We've got something here cross 7, but is it 14? Is it 12? Is it 8? Is it 7? Is it all of these? I'm just not, not really getting much. And that's, that's basically where, where we get stuck. So at this point, I want to come back to this issue of Toxi and HS, HSQC, Toxi, HMQC, Toxi. All right, so just, just to review here, this is, this is the cartoon spectrum I gave you of of propanol for HMQC and the cartoon spectrum I gave you of propanol for toxi, right? So this is, this is one propanol, so it's HOCH2, CH2, CH3. And obviously, obviously this is trivial, but it's a schematic. And so when we when we looked at this and we looked at HMQC, we said, OK, if we number our carbon resonances, 1, 2, and 3, and we letter our proton resonances, A, B, C, and D, then we can go ahead and transcribe that information over to, for example, the toxi and start to see our our cross peaks. So here we've got, let's see, if we do this here, we've got 1A, we've got 2C, and we've got 3D. And with COSY and TOXY, what we're doing is basically saying, okay, 1A, B, 2C, 3D. And we're saying, okay, 3D is crossing with 2C. And 1A is crossing with 2C, and this would, this would come from the cozy, and then this guy is new to the toxy, 
I'll say specific to Toxi. Right, this is your one, one A to three C, right? So we know in this molecule that this is B, that this is C, C1 to H2A, that this is C2, H2C, this is C3, H3D. Your cozy gives you this cross peak here and this cross peak here. Your toxy gives you that extra cross peak. So what you've got in the toxy is you get basically this total correlation that allows you to walk through. And the reason toxy can be really powerful is if you've got a region where you've got heavy overlap, but you've got one proton that's not overlapping, you can make your way through it. We saw this in the Vailala thing where the whole beta proton region was very crowded. And if you had to work your way through that sort of beta gamma proton region, going from methyls in like isoleucine or leucine to beta and gamma protons to alpha protons and NHs by COSY, we would have gotten lost in that region around two parts per million. But by having the toxy, you could just say, all right, we've got an NH that's exposed, or we've got an alpha proton that's exposed. I can see that that NH or that alpha proton correlates with these beta protons, these methyls, et cetera, et cetera. So the toxy is really powerful in some cases. So what HMQC toxy is, is like is it's basically like toxy but gives you the di dispersion of the C13 dimension. And what's nice about having the dispersion of the C13 dimension is there's a lot less overlap in carbon-13. You get a digital resolution that gives you maybe you know, 1,000 points, 1024 points, say, of digital resolution. You can resolve sort of to about 2 tenths of a ppm. You may be able to push it a little higher by zero filling and collecting more data. But basically, you've got a lot of dispersion in your C13 dimension. In other words, your proton dimension, sure, you've got a lot of digital resolution, but your peaks are multiplets. And as we saw in the proton spectrum, those multiplets often overlap. Very often in the carbon spectrum, your singlets are going to be all or mostly dispersed enough that they don't overlap. And your HMQC and your HMBC techniques are going to be sharp enough to resolve all or most of them. And ditto, when we have the HMQC toxy technique, we're going to be able to get a lot more resolution in the F1 dimension, in the indirect dimension. Now, what's nice is you can vary the mixing time in this experiment and do the experiment with a series of mixing times so that you're getting the dispersion of this dimension and using it kind of like a super cozy. In other words, if we have a short mixing time, we can go from, say, so if I, again, if I call this, um, if I call this, say, 3D and this 2C and this 1A and I call this 1 and 2 and 3, we can go from here to here. In other words, we can go from 3D to 2, and we can go here from 1A to 2 and get sort of a cozy-like behavior in this F1 dimension. Of course, you can do the same thing in the other dimension just as well. In other words, we can go like from 3D to 2C over here. But what's nice about having the carbon dimension is if we're caught in a quagmire of overlap in the proton dimension, we can get ourselves out by going in the carbon dimension. And what's also nice is you can vary the mixing time so you can hop your way from one to the next to the next. So in this schematic, when we go to a longer mixing time, now we've hopped from 3D to 2, and then we've hopped from two to one. So you're basically able to build up a chain at any point 
using the carbon dimension at any point where you have a clear shot in the proton dimension. Is, is there any big disadvantage to using a longer mixing time always? Um, well, I mean, the big disadvantage to using a longer mixing time always is you wouldn't get that sequential information here. You wouldn't get it going from one to the next to the next. I mean, the other disadvantage of a long mixing time is you go too long and you've got relaxation working against you and signal to noise. But the main thing is here you're walking your way through. And the best way to see this now is really to go ahead and to look at this applied to our current problem of the bromomalleol isomer. So what I'd like to do at this point is to go to the next page and show you first a schematic, but then we'll go to the real spectrum, and then we'll use the real power of varying the mixing time to really build up this structure. All right, so this is a schematic. And again, I've taken this all from, from your textbook reading. So this is a schematic where we're going to walk our way along the F2 dimension. Remember, that's the less powerful dimension. The F1 is going to be that carbon dimension. And so what the author has done here is taken a series of slices along the line at 61 ppm, along the line of which was 61 in the, um, in the HM. 61, I think, was, um, was 4. So he's taken a line. So this is the one that we called number four. And what he's done is this is just the HMQC or HSQC, as I said, for, for your intents and purposes, the two techniques are the same. Here he's made a schematic. We'll see the real thing in just a moment of, I'm sorry, he's using HMQC. So of the HMQC toxi with a mixing time, a short mixing time. And short is relative. It's going to depend on the magnitude of a coupling constant. The bigger the coupling constant, the more quickly coupling information will travel. So in other words, if you have a 10 hertz coupling constant, things will transfer in, in the order of a few milliseconds. You'll start to see a cross peak for the next hop. If you have a very small coupling constant, it's going to take longer. And of course, if you're completely at right angles, you're going to get much, much slower transfer, not at all. So here's a short mixing time. This is, in this schematic, it's 14 milliseconds. And so that basically has taken us from 4 to 10. And so that's what we have over here. And then we were suspecting that 8 came in next because we had the 8 overlapping with 7 and 8 overlapping with 5. And here, as you increase the mixing time, and now we're, we're going here, so HMQC toxi with longer mixing time. This is 36 milliseconds. Now your next cross peak comes in, and so we've hopped over to 8. Let me show you the actual spectrum, and you'll be able, you'll be able to see this. So here's the... Here's the 14 millisecond mixing time actual spectrum. And this is the schematic of the slice that we just, just looked at. So this is the 14, so I'll write 14, I guess I've written 14 millisecond up on the top. And so this hop here is our C4 H to C10 H2 hop at this point. And as I said, if we continued on, we'd see a next hop here. I'll show you how to get that even out of, even out of this short one. But here's the real power of the technique is you can go up. So here, for example, we're saying, OK, we're fine on 10. But then, for example, as we go here, and you see that this is your right, this is your C10 
cross peak, so this is, let me transcribe all of our numbers here. So I'll go 4, 10, 10, 8, 5, 14, 12, 14, 8, 7, 3, 9, 11, 12 down here, 15, 13, and 7. So what's nice is you can come here and say, all right, we're hopping from, um, from 10 over to 8 is our next hop. I'll just write it as 10 to 8. But what's really powerful is you don't have to deal with this ambiguity here. You don't have to say, all right, I think this is 8, not 5, and I think this is 8, not 5, because you can come in the carbon dimension and say, oh, clearly we're hopping from 10 to 8. And if we increase the mixing time, you wouldn't even have to get into this quagmire here because in that schematic where we went to the 36 millisecond mixing time, the next thing that would show up at the 36 millisecond mixing time would be a cross peak right over here. All right, so that anyway builds up, builds up part of the molecule. That builds up one spin system in the molecule, because now we're going to C8H2. All right, let's at this point tackle the next spin system in the molecule. And so what's nice is we've got a nice clear shot off of C3. You could work off of other parts if you want. But let's just work off of C3. Now this is our 14 millisecond one. And so here we've gone from 3 and at this 14 millisecond one, 5 is starting to pop up, uh, or is, has popped up. And then we're starting to have the next one pop up, which is to, let's see, I'm having a little trouble seeing my alignment here. It is to, um, to 12. So we're starting to build up another spin system. But don't take my word for it, because on the next page, I'll show you the time course. So the author of this went ahead and they did mixing times of 6 milliseconds, 14 milliseconds, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do now is just look at this strip under C3 with varying mixing times. So he's taken toxic spectra with a whole bunch of, of mixing times. Uh, well, it's out of the, the Croesman book, so I assume it's the authors there. It's, it's out of Croesman, and well, it's your reading assignment, so yeah. it's on there. And I forget who the authors are. It's chapter 11. Okay. So think American Airlines, chapter 11. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> all right. So this is all for looking at tracks for, for C3. All right. So here we've gone from C3H at 6 milliseconds to C5H. And so let me, let me start to build this up on the blackboard. So we're going from C3H to C5H. And that's with 6 milliseconds. And you can see the next one is just popping, popping up here. At 14, it's getting well developed. So we've gone from C5H to C12H2. All right, at 24 milliseconds, the C12H2 cross peak is well developed. 
And by the time we're coming up to 36 milliseconds, we're getting a new cross peak. So now, all on the C3 track, we're hopping from C12 H2 up to C14 H2. So we are literally building up this chain in the crowded region of our bromomalleol isomer. And now, as he continues up to 48 milliseconds, now we see a new peak developing that's actually developing rather well by the next one. So we're going from C14H2 up to C7H2. All right, so that basically gives us our spin systems without ever having to deal with that quagmire of the cozy. Now, we're at bromomalleol, so we have a bunch of stuff that we still need to deal with. We have an oxygen, we have a bromine, we have carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 6 that are unaccounted for. These are our quats. And then we have our isolated methyls. So we have all of these methyl singlets. And so we have C9H3, C11H3, C13H3, and C15H3 that we need to put together. All right, at this point for putting the pieces together, I'm going to turn to our, um, I'm going to turn to the HMBC spectrum. And we can start just about anywhere. Generally, I like to start on isolated peaks. And so let me just label it. He's just taken some slices. So this is just slices from the H1 dimension. So the authors have taken C3H. They've taken our C9H3, C11H3, C13. These are our methyl singlets, C13H3, and C15H3. And we can just move along our HMBC tracks. Isolated methyls are great because you can use them. They're going to be on a quat. And right, they're isolated. They're singlets. They're going to be on a quat. They're always going to give cross peaks with carbons, the three bond cross peaks. So they're super, super powerful. So for example, our C11 is giving cross peak. So this is C11H3 is giving a cross peak here with C13H3. So C13H3 is another isolated methyl. So when two isolated methyls give a cross peak, that's a gem dimethyl. So that's cool. So we have our C11H3. And our C13H3, and they're going to have to cross through a quat carbon. All right, what else does C11H3 cross with? C11H3 crosses with C5H. Now, that's really powerful because if it's crossing, the three bond coupling is going to put us through the quat carbon onto a carbon that's part of a spin system. So that gives us a cross here. And now I didn't show this in the first spectrum, but we have a couple of carbons, carbon 1 and 2, that are way downfield. So we have this crossing with carbon 1, C11H3 crosses with carbon 1. So that's carbon 
1. Carbon 1 has one more valence on it. Remember, carbon 1 is at 80 parts per million, a little downfield of 80 parts per million. We have an oxygen in the molecule. That oxygen isn't a carbonyl. What is it? It has to be an ether, right? It's not a carbonyl. It's one oxygen. It's an ether. So that's onto carbon 1. So that's kind of, kind of powerful. All right, let's take a look. By the way, these guys are close together. If you slap a grid on this, you'll see there's actually two tracks here. So the track that's on the left actually, let's see, which? Oh, yeah. So the track that's on the left basically mirrors the track that's on the right. So you see this track over here, one, two, three, end up mirroring this other one. So this we, do, we don't even need to solve this. But this here, for example, is C13, H3, with C11, H3. That makes sense, right? Because these guys are geminal. So C11 is going to see what C13 sees. This one over here is C13, H3, to C5, H, right? Because that's seeing the same thing. And this last one here is C13, H3 to C1. So OK, so that's, that's that. But let's go ahead and we'll come off of C9 here. C9 will be interesting. So we've got over here, we've got C9, H3 to C2. That's, that's useful. So we've got an isolated methyl, and it's off of another quat. And that quad is C2. And then we've got, let's see what else we have for it. We have C9H3 off of CH3, uh, C3H rather. OK, that's kind of useful. And we have C9H3 off of C8. H2. OK. So that's, that's useful because look at this. Now that's going to bring our C9 into this fold here. We know that C2, right? C2 is down practically at 80 parts per million as well. So what's C2 on? It's got to be on the oxygen. So we've got our C2, our C9H3. We get a bond here, because that's an isolated methyl. So it's going through a quat to a J-coupled one. They're not J-coupled to each other, so it's not directly bonded. And it has to go through C2 to C8. So now we're doing very well, if you think about it. I can put a check next to our C1, a check next to our C2, a check next to our oxygen, a check next to C9, a check next to C11, check next to C13. We have just C15. You can get C15 a couple of ways. If you want, you can deal with the crowded tracks here. If not, you can go off of somewhere else. We can do it both ways here. So here, off of our C3H, we can go here, and we get C3H to C15H3. OK, that's not very useful. C12H2, that's not very useful. Oh, wait, to C, oh, C15. Oh, OK, that is useful, because we've got another isolated methyl. And that methyl is isolated. So that's going to be on the quat. That's going to be on the C C6. So in other words, we have our C15H3. We have our C6. If we're getting a cross between CH3 and C15H, that's got to put it in over here. 
Now, if you're having trouble coming at it that way, you can just look at these remaining, remaining three cross peaks, which I'll do in a moment. All right, let's see what other cross peaks we have. We have a cross peak with C3H and C9H3, C8H2. OK, C8H2, that makes sense. C9H3, that makes sense. That's no new information. C7H2, if you're crowded here, well, we can get it in another way. But that has to come through C6. So one way you can get the connectivity is just to say, OK, now we're getting a cross peak from C3 H over to C7. Then we have a cross peak to C5H and a cross peak to, so C5H, that's pretty trivial because that's just your two bond coupling. A cross peak to C4H, so we're going from C3 to C4. Okay, that's that's useful because that means we build up through C6. And we also get a cross peak over here to C2. That cross peak is coming here. If you don't like that and you don't like that way of doing it, you can just say, all right, let's deal with these two singlets that are close together over here. You can slap a grid on it if you like. position the grid line right down the right down the center here and you can say okay these three are off on the left this one and these two are off on the right so if you prefer to do it this way you can come at it and say okay this is C15 H3 over to C7 H2 so that is giving you that's giving you this bond as well. So if you had trouble, that's not a double bond. That's just me reemphasizing that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Over here, we're coming from C15H3 over to C4H and C15H3 over to C3H. And so that's saying, OK, we've got our isolated methyl over to C4, and we've got our isolated methyl to C3. So no matter how you approach it, you've ended up putting this skeleton together. And at this point, we have precisely one valence left in the molecule. We filled all of our valencies. And so our remaining valence is over here and is our bromine, which explains which explains why that carbon is a little bit on the downfield side. So at this point, let's return to our bromomaliol structure and deal with what's happened here. C3 is shifted far downfield. It's a, it's a tertiary carbon. That'll shift it downfield. It's beta to an oxygen. That's it's, it's surprisingly far downfield, but it is, it is that far downfield. Bromine, bromine, you know, remember when I talked about carbon, I said for carbon NMR, that region, oxygen is pretty diagnostic for going downfield. Nitrogen, bromine, chlorine, not so much. Proton and carbon roughly parallel each other, but carbon is a lot more sensitive to substitution patterns. Proton, you can say, all right, this is really a CH2 next to an oxygen or next to a bromine, but not so much for carbon, where if you're next to a bromine, it's, like, ah, it's still in that kind of cluster of you know, 10 to 50 ppm or a little further downfield. So let me rewrite our structure. I'm not going to go through the determination of stereochemistry on it, 
but I think you'll see, you'll see what's happened in just a moment. So I'll give us all of our numbers here. So we have this ring is 6, 7, 14, 12, 5, and 3. This ring here is 2, 8, 10, and 4. And now we have whoops, a new ring that's a tetrahydrofuran ring. And that tetrahydrofuran has C13H3 and C11H3 off of it. And we have our C9. So since we are all organic chemists, let's return back to what's happened here. So we started with this compound that contained a strain cyclopropane ring. And a tertiary alcohol group. And we had, I'll put H plus in quotes because, of course, your catalytic cycle is getting driven by H plus, even though you're starting it with a minuscule amount of D plus. So you end up protonating the oxygen, getting a tertiary carbocation, getting a migration here that's going to be very interesting because now you can start to say, okay, what's going to happen over here to get us over to there? And I will leave you, I will leave you to think about the mechanism and the process that has to occur to go ahead and break this bond and form a bond to oxygen. All right, I think on that note, I want to wrap up. And I guess the thing to do now is to think about how you can use this technique to help deal with crowded overlap situations. All right, we will pick up and talk about a few more techniques on Friday.